misled them. Proud Polynesians, hovering dark as an eagle over us. The plain was filled with his nodding plumes and bristled with thirsty Argive spirits. But Zeus saw. Zeus heard his boasting and watched his glittering army flood the plain. Zeus saw and sent him crashing down. This was our victory. This is the theme of our song in the temples of the gods. Dancing till a new dawn comes in honor of Zeus and the eagles fall. Antigone is a play that has been done here before. Peter McCarthy suggested that we might revive it um, for the senior play. About 10 years ago it was a junior play. Um, and that's a challenge for young, younger actors. So we thought we could probably do it again a decade on and with uh, maybe an older troupe and, I don't know, perhaps bring more out in it. My Lord Tiresias, you are welcome. Have you come with news around some other errand? What is it that's brought you here? I've come to bring you news. News and advice. I've always been guided by your advice, my lord. Then listen to me now, for you're standing on the razor's edge. A razor's edge? What do you mean? Listen, and I'll tell you what happened. I was sitting in my ancient place of prophecy, when suddenly I heard a strange, wild sound. Birds screaming madly overhead, flapping their wings wildly, tearing at each other with their talons, till the whole sky was filled with their cries. Essentially, the play is based on ancient myths surrounding Thebes and the, and, and the house of Oedipus, and the continuing um, curse on that house. So Antigone of the title is his daughter. He has already left Thebes, abandoned it, um, and her brothers, on his departure, fight over who's to be king. But they end up having a fight to the death in single combat. And so the, the regent, their uncle, Creon, becomes king as the next male heir. Um, but the story really based, is based around the idea of the sacred rites of burial in ancient Greece. And that the journey of the soul would not be complete without correct funeral rites. Polynices, no longer to be called my nephew, shall lie as a base corpse in the battlefield, to be eaten by vultures and wild dogs, as befits one who has dishonored his city. What is it? What are you hiding from me? You don't know how Creon is treating our brothers? Honoring one and disgracing the other. How he is bearing Eteclid with all the pomp and honor the dead deserve, but is leaving Polynices' corpse unwashed, unburied, for vultures to feed on. Well, I'm Ms. Renee. I'm Antigone's sister and Creon's niece. And I play the role of sort of the sister who's meek and doesn't really want to go against Creon's law to help her brothers, which is kind of selfish, but she doesn't want to die. And she ends up not dying, so... Pretty good role. Everybody else dies. <laughs>
to a place of reward and eternity, far away from this mortal life, which has grown so lonely and ugly. But Kreia's law is clear. You risk death if you defy his law. I face something far worse than death if I do not defy the law. I face eternal shame which will haunt me in this life and beyond. I will send my brother to the afterlife, even if it means I will soon join him there. Can nothing dissuade you from this action? No, nothing will stop me. When the written law is against you, turn to the unwritten law. When the written law is against you, uh, turn to the unwritten law. So what she means by that is, you know, stand up for what you morally believe to be is right, or believe to be morally right. And, you know, you can see this throughout history. You can see this with Nelson Mandela going up against the apartheid. It's peaceful protest. You know, she isn't in open rebellion against Creon. It's all very peaceful. You know, Rosa Parks refusing to give up her seat, all peaceful as well. So it's, it's essentially just, you should stand up for your morals. Well, the chorus traditionally um, comments on the action in between scenes and sometimes interacts with the, with, the, with the main characters, almost providing that voice of, of the common man or the, the audience nearly. In this case, we've stripped the chorus right down to, to one person. Um, we have an introductory chorus uh, which introduces the, the play and um, an invocation to the gods of, of tragic poetry, but uh, Annie Janssen is the the main chorus person throughout the play. She's always there, present, sometimes just sitting on the corner of the stage, observing and interjecting. And then in, in, uh, between episodes, she delivers choral odes, which in some cases comment on the action, but in a more general way about, you know, man, uh, his ingenuity, uh, love, and how it conquers all. Man. Am I? The first of wonders. I have conquered baffling diseases, and yet I am bound by death, and the wind mocks my striving. It's not always easy to dress the stage with our Colum in Columbus the way it's configured, so we have a couple of drapes with a sort of, uh, you know, a a symbol of state on them as part of the the uh, the, the stage set that was very handy and um, we have Sophia Fingiva who's designed the poster. Of course it's harder if the scenery is not as adapted uh, I mean we have a very static um, scenery all the time and most of the actions in the play are uh, concerning words and speeches and soliloquies and Antigone's um, case and I think that's what makes this play very different and I think that's a good that's a great thing I didn't have any problems with that um I guess I, I guess I just had to take it bit by bit and take each I don't know each four or five lines and each because each stage of the soliloquy is like a different story it's Creon who's the king won't let her do what is right and what everyone knows is right it's the laws of the gods they, but Creon because of his pride and his anger towards Polynices isn't letting her bury her brother and um, I think what what I did was was getting to try to get into character and try to understand where Antigone was coming from, and it was very difficult because um, I couldn't imagine like losing both your brothers and not being able to bury one of them. Um, but I think I just took one, I took each paragraph or each four or five lines at at a time, read it, and sort of like tried to understand what was going on, and then just you know em emulate what I feel like Antigone would have wanted the message Antigone would have wanted to put across. It shows, well, I come in and I plead to let me die with her, but she refuses uh, all the times. In a way, this shows that Antigone doesn't, she's trying to punish me for not helping her in the first place, but as well as she also doesn't want me to suffer for something that I didn't do. But this also shows how indecisive my character is, because I didn't really do the dirty work, but I'm begging to die with her because I want to honour my brother, because I've finally realised that, wait, it's a bad thing not honouring my own brother. Mine will be enough. But how will I live without you? Ask Creon. Isn't he the one you love? Antigone, I beg you, let me die with you. No, you chose to live. It was I who chose death. 
It, had, it took a lot of time to just read the text over and over again and really understand when there's the big transition. Because at the start he's making all these grand speeches and he seems like this normal leader, but then we see in certain scenes with the guard and Antigone, he, he has quite a short temper and he loses it really easily. So we see that he, he's not so certain about what he wants to do. And then as I furthered into the text, I saw that when Tiresias comes, he kind of breaks. There's something in him and he goes. My lord Tiresias, in every state when something goes wrong, the easiest target is the king. Even you're using me as a scapegoat now, making up prophecies to try and frighten me. Tell me, who paid you to say this? Who bribed you to betray me? Paid me? Bribed me? You can't really change the scenes much. And like, I love the leaves on the stage because like, I'm barefoot and you can actually feel the ancient part of it as I'm saying the prophecy which is quite effective because I am screaming and shouting my lungs out trying to pass this prophecy. Very well. Listen to me now. I solemnly swear to you that before the sun has come and gone, your son, your own son, will be sacrificed to pay your debts to death. Once for the life that you have sent to a living grave, and once for the corpse that you refuse to honor, there is no avoiding it. Not long from now, your palace and your city will be filled with weeping, and the pollution will spread, carried by the animals and the carrion birds that have fed on Moinesis, until all the snakes round feet rise up and come to destroy her. I think the thing I found most challenging about this part was uh, really bringing it to life with such an astounding cast. Uh, this time around we have such a good cast and trying to find your place in that cast is quite hard. But once you do, it, it becomes very easy because the cast work really well together and we play off each other very well. You suddenly said something that shot us all up quick. It scared the living daylights out of us. What was that? Well, my lord, he, he, he pointed out that someone would have to come and tell you what had happened. It's more a labor of love, I feel, than other plays. Um, you know, when there's, you know, lots of maybe singing or dancing or um, stuff of this nature. Because you're really creating art as opposed to something that'll just, you know, entertain a lot of people. I pity her. She doesn't deserve to die. They're saying that burying her dead brother wasn't a crime, but it would have been to leave him lying for dogs or birds to nibble at. They're saying she deserves a golden crown for what she's done. Not a traitor's death. You know, it's very raw. You know, it's just uh, myself and Tunin who plays my father. Um, on the stage alone, just the two of us. I think what sets it apart from possibly uh, other characters is just like sort of the pure emotion, you know, because a few times now in the school I've played a character similar uh, to Heyman, like a sort of naive uh, kid who's still learning about the world and in a lot of ways I feel Heyman is still that but um, there's, there's, a, there's a darkness to Heyman that I haven't seen in other characters, you know, Heyman is kind of sees the world in slightly a more sinister way. I'm only trying to show you how wrong you are. Wrong? <laughs> you'll soon find out who's wrong. And you'll wish you never did. Bring in that viper Antigone! Bring her in here and have her executed! So this boy can watch her die! No! That's one thing I'll never do. Find someone else and watch you play the tyrant. I've seen enough. Most plays, you'll have people die on screen, you know, so they're able to create emotion through their actual death. You know, you followed this character through the play, you know, you look at Hamlet, he dies on stage, you have Horatio coming down to him to say, goodnight, sweet prince, and all that. Whereas in Sophoclean tragedies, 
it, all the all the uh, violence is done off stage. So what you have to do then, the messenger and what I do, I come out and I have to report to the audience, but also Eurydice, the horrid, horrid things I've just seen and witnessed. You know, Haman killing himself, Creon screaming in agony, and Antigone hanging there in the corner of the cave. So you really have to try and convey that absolutely atrocious, just cruel emotion through it. So it's, yeah, it's challenging, no doubt about it. His eyes flashing red with hatred. And then suddenly, he spat full in the face of the king. And before he could stop him, he drew his sword and swung behind the crib. But the king left out of the way. And Haman turned the sword against himself, thrusting it deep into his own body. Then, with blood gushing and bubbling from his mouth, he, he kissed Antigone for the last time, so that her pale cheeks might be stained crimson with his blood. And then they lay together, bride and groom, married at last in death. I've, I've put in what we'd call like a soundscape or sound design. So that's interesting. I don't think that was there necessarily before. And it's not just before the the scenes begin or or to to punctuate the different scenes. I've We've put it in behind some of the longer speeches and dialogue and try and some of the conflict um, in between two characters which hopefully adds to the, the tension. I actually did an audition for Antigone but um, a girl dropped out so Mr McCarthy asked me to do it because it's only a small part so it means that I haven't been coming to every single rehearsal I've only really been to like the main ones. Being in sixth form, you can't really take a large part because you have so much work to do. And um, I found it quite hard to be able to, even with just such a small part, to be able to deal with all of the um, prep, but I'm kind of managing. Um, Mr. McCarthy s said that it was okay that I did prep during the dress rehearsals and I'm pretty much finding any break I can to, you know, do some work because otherwise I feel like I'm doing nothing. <laughs> The Queen, his mother, has taken her own life. She died, and as darkness snatched at her, she, she cursed you, cursed the King, her husband, and his son's At the end scene, he loses the jacket and he's open and his whole, his top two buttons are off because he's a disheveled man now. I'm tainted with disaster. Will you not kill me too? I long for death. The Dark Lord. To lay me down. The darkness. I think the message of the play really is to follow your gut instinct. Um, to really stand up for what you believe in. The greatest gifts a man can have are wisdom and the fear of heaven. Man's pride will always be punished and all his boastfulness brought low. I'd just like to thank Mr McCarthy and Mr Swift because they've put so much work into this and it's really turned out to be a brilliant play and lots of people have told me so. So I think they both deserve a big round of applause.